Now, Jacob cooked some beef stew, some peas and rice, some cassava and some plantain. Plantain, not plantain. And Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom means red man. In order for Esau to be named after the stew that he ate, he must have eaten a lot of that stew. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. I am so hungry. Sounds like Zoe and Roman. Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm about to die. He says, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Jacob said, if it's no big deal, then sell it to me. Jacob says, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Y'all, we're going to have fun today. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful for your presence. God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is in this room right now, but not in this physical room, but it's in our bodies. For you said in your word that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you're filling us with peace, filling us with purpose, filling us with joy. God, I pray even now that you would transform every single person's life, that we would never be the same after this encounter with your presence. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody shout amen. Amen. Come on, Baltimore, shout amen. amen. We are starting a brand new series today called Out of Order. Out of Order. I I never forget, I was at the the DMV, uh, which if you are not familiar uh, with the DMV, it is a place of God. It it, it is a place that that God uses, a tool in the hand of Almighty God uh, to develop patience, to develop perseverance, um, to make sure that you are long-suffering, according to the, the gospel where it says in Galatians 5 that, that Christians should suffer long at the DMV. It's somewhere, and it must be in the book of Hezekiah or whatever, maybe. But I, I was all ready for this day at the DMV. I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. I had a nice, long, thick book. I had my computer. I figured I could just write an entire message here in the DMV since I'm going to be here for my entire day. And I'm sitting there, and then all of a sudden, I hear this ruckus going on. This woman is yelling, she's screaming, I'm, I'm hearing boops and bruises, and, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be the day. Where is my phone? I'm going to be famous. Off of <laughs> this is the day that it is going down at the DMV, y'all. There is a fight that broke out at the DMV. I'm thinking someone reached across the table, grabbed that teller, and said, if you don't give me my driver's license or whatever it may be. I'm looking around for this fight, and when I finally find this fight, it wasn't a woman versus a woman. It wasn't a man versus a woman. It wasn't a man versus a man. It was a woman versus a vending machine. (laughs) This lady was going kung fu panda on that Pepsi machine. I mean, she is elbowing it, dropping knees. She is, I mean, just going off on that. I felt bad for the vending machine. I don't know what that lady had been through. I don't know what burden she was carrying. Clearly, she missed the Freedom Conference that's coming up in a few weeks because she was carrying some things that God never intended. Y'all, they called security to drag this woman away. That must have been her last dollar. I don't know what happened. But as they dragged her away, I noticed this little sign on the vending machine that said, out of order. It's a rough day. Here's the problem when things are out of order. They don't work. That was deep. Y'all, you're not right. I told you it's going to be great notes today. When things are out of order, they don't work. Boy, that's a revelation. No, seriously, duh. 
When something is out of order, when something's malfunctioning, it does not work. We get that. We understand that. When you put your key in the ignition of a car that's out of order and you start here, it won't work. When your refrigerator finally gives out or whatever it may be, when something is out of order, it doesn't work. Watch this. No matter what we put into it. You could put every dollar bill that you have in your pocket. It still won't produce. And and I like those vending machines that work, but they're broken. So you swipe your card or you put a dollar in, you hit for the M&Ms and it gives you some Reese's. (laughs) It's one thing if it gives you nothing. It's completely different if what it gives you is not what you requested. Here's the problem. It's out of order. And if it's out of order, it won't work. It won't produce what it was designed to produce. The problem is, so for so many of us, when, we, when we're inputting into something and it's not producing what we're looking for it to produce, guess what we do? We try harder. We, we, we put more in, more effort. I just must not be trying hard enough. I must not be giving it my all. I must not be leaning. No, 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 no. It is out of order. So watch this. When a marriage is out of order, it doesn't matter the effort that you put in. It will never produce the love, the support, the security that a marriage was designed to produce because it has to be in God's order. When your faith is out of order, it will never produce the peace the purpose, the prosperity that God's word promises that faith produces because it is out of order. When your gifts, when your talents, when your abilities are out of order, it will never produce the opportunities, the open doors, the income that your gifts and talents were designed to produce because it is out of order. Order matters. So over these next few weeks, we're going to be talking about some different areas, some different things that are out of order in our lives. And if we don't get them into the right order, some of you, you could just close your Bible. You're finished taking notes. You've heard the entire message that you need for today. Some of you, your greatest effort and frustration has been, I'm not getting what I want and I'm trying harder. And it's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of determining what is God's divine order for this area so that it can produce what it was designed to produce. But here's what the Bible says in Peter. It says, I pray that everything around you may be a reflection of everything in you. I pray that you may prosper, that means to move forward in life, and be in health, Baltimore, as your soul prospers. For for the sake of time, your soul's just your insides. (laughs) I pray that your outsides look like your insides. In other words, before I could get my marriage in order, my money in order, my faith in order, before I could get the things around me in order, I have to get the things inside of me in order. And hear me, there is a divine order from the Word of God that the inside of our life needs to look like, and our marriage will never line up, our money will never line up, our self-esteem, our confidence, none of those other things will line up until this lines up. So today we're going to talk about how do, I, how do I get myself in order? You may have heard me preach this, one of my favorite kind of revelations from Scripture. But the Bible says that we as humans were made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, 26, it says, Let us make mankind in the image of God. In the image of God, they made him. Now, God is one God. Somebody say one God. I told you, you're going to feel like you're in Destiny College today. We're, we're going to get hot in It's one God. But he manifests himself in three forms. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's one God, but he manifests himself in three forms. Now, you were made in the image of God. And if you were made in the image of God, it means that you look just like God. If God is one God in three forms. It's so funny. People say, I don't understand the Trinity. You don't have to understand the Trinity. Just understand you. And as soon as you understand you, you'll understand the Trinity. We don't serve three gods. We serve one God. But three forms, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You is you. Not good English, but it's good preaching. There's only one you, right? Some husbands are like, well. (laughs) Keep moving, preacher, keep moving. It's one you, but God made you in three forms. 
There's your physical body. Somebody say my flesh. That, that's what you see. That's what you feel. It's, it's my body. This is, this is what needs food. This is what gets hangry <laughs> if you don't feed me three times a day. This is what gets cranky when I'm tired and exhausted. This, this is what needs hugs and affection. It's my, it's my body. It's my flesh. I, I have a physical body, but I also have a soul. The Bible says that your soul is your mind, your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. When, when, when we think about soul, here's a phrase that talks about soul. You know how people say, it's the heart of a man. I, I want to know what their heart is like. We're not talking about their physical heart. We're, we're talking about their soul. I want to know what their, their thought life is like, what their ambitions, what their goals are, what their emotions. Your soul is where sadness resides. Your soul is where joy and happiness and, and, and fear and anxiety, your soul is the heart of who you are. And then every single person has a spirit. So you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Hear me, your spirit is the real you. Your spirit is the essence of who you are. Your spirit, the Bible says, that is what lives on for all of eternity. It doesn't matter how saved you are, your flesh is going to die. At some point, this is going back to the ground, and the Bible says God's going to give you a new body. I always say when I get to heaven, my body is going to be six foot four, 225 of jack steel, and I'll never have to work out for it. Don't laugh. That's my dream. That's my vision. Don't burst my bubble. <laughs> Your flesh is going to go. When you get to heaven, you'll still be you, but, but you'll have a renewed mind, a renewed heart, renewed emotions. But your spirit is what lives for all of eternity. Somebody says flesh, soul, and spirit. There's three parts of you. But here's the thing. God designed your flesh and your soul and your spirit to be in a certain order. And in that proper order, things go according to plan. But when things get out of order, life starts getting awry. So the way that God designed it is that your flesh would be ruled by your soul. So that you're not ruled by your feelings, or your hunger, or your fatigue, or your exhaustion, but your flesh is ruled by your thoughts, and your emotions, and, and your desires, and your heart. But it designed that your soul is ruled by your spirit. You guys look confused. I need some social distance and illustration. Come on, Devin. Come on. Uh, come, 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 come. We, let's see how we're going to do this. Can y'all give it up for my spirit, my soul? All right. So this right here is flesh, right? This right here, all soul. Oh, you're so godly. Look at spirit. Right? So, y'all ready? Turn around. This is how life was designed once you become a follower of God. That the spirit of God inside of you governs your emotions, your thoughts, your desires, and your heart, and your flesh follows up the real, rear. But what happens is life gets out of order. One way that our flesh takes control is when we neglect our flesh. There is nothing like fatigue and exhaustion. Flip around, guys. Turn around. That puts our flesh in control. You see, that's what happened to Esau. Esau was starving hungry. And because he was starving hungry, hunger overcame common sense. He said, give me your birthright. I wish I had time to preach this, y'all. A person's birthright as the firstborn child you stood to inherit two-thirds of your father's wealth, no matter how many siblings you had. The rest of them jokers had to divide the leftovers. You got two-thirds. And I don't know if you read the word of God, but Esau was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham, y'all, was loaded. This was like being Jeff Bezos' grandson. I mean, Abram was loaded, loaded. And then watch this. Isaac, Abraham's son, the Bible says he had his own blessings that had nothing to do with his father. So Esau stood to inherit probably billions of dollars. That better have been some good beef stew and rice because he gave it all up for a bowl of stew. All because he neglected his flesh. He was hungry 
and exhausted. Watch me, hunger and exhaustion will put your flesh in the front. Can y'all switch spaces? But isolation and unhealthy relationships will put your soul up front. When you decide to isolate yourself from other human beings, where you don't have other people that can check your emotions, can tell you, no, 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 that's not really how you're not seen. It's not as bad as you think it is. When you're isolated, your, your emotions take over, your feelings take over, your paranoia takes over. When you have unhealthy relationships in your life, people that are codependent, that take more from you than they give to you. People that have this perfection expectation of you, nothing that you do is good enough. Abusive relationships or whatever it may be, you become a soul-driven person. And here's your poor spirit in the back. You just dragging the Holy Spirit into all types of foolishness because your life is out of order. Can y'all give it up for my spirit, my soul? So here's the thing. Without even realizing it, our life can get all out of order. And we're confused. Somebody say preach. While I've been praying and fasting for 21 days, seeking God. I haven't missed the catalyst in three years. I'm putting in the effort. But I'm not getting the results that God's word says I should get. Because when things are out of order, it doesn't matter what you put in. You're not going to get the right things out. The problem with our spirit is, our spirit is the quiet one. You know, you all have a group of friends. And it's always a loud mouth. Every group of friends, even it just takes three people, you're going to get three personalities. You're going to get the jokester. You're going to get the one all got something funny to say. I mean, you have four flat tires. You're in the middle of the country. You No AAA, no cell phone. Boy, this is going to make a good story one day. Will you shut up? You got the one friend that's the controller. That's your flesh. I always want to take charge. All right, guys, this is what we're going to do. And you got that one friend that's just quiet. They're not up. They're not down. They're, that's your spirit. You see, when your flesh is starving, it screams, I'm hungry. Make sense? When your soul is depressed, it says, I hate you. I actually hate everybody. I never want to leave the house. I'm going to stay right here under the covers. But for many of us, we don't know what our spirit says when it's starving. We don't know what it feels like for our spirit man to be neglected. Because oftentimes, that's the quiet part of who we are. And we're there is nothing worse than feeling like you're completely right and you're completely wrong, not even realizing. I just thought about someone who put your shirt on backwards and you feeling good, but your tag's on the wrong side. <laughs> just strutting, oh, look at me. When things are out of order, man, it doesn't matter what we put in. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart because there's so many frustrated people that are quitting and walking away because I gave it my all, and it just didn't produce what I was looking for. Not realizing it's not an effort thing. Matter of fact, if you're trying too hard, something must be out of order. Because he said, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Yes, we fight the enemy. Yes, we face hardship and trials and all that. But if loving Jesus is difficult, something is out of order. I'm going to give you just three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts of how do, how do I get things back in the godly order, in the right order? The first thought is this. You need to embrace your humanity. You need to embrace your humanity. I, I was talking to a friend, and they said, I'm so confused about the church's view on my flesh. This person was a pastor. But they said, here's the thing. You, you, if, if you grew up in, in church, church, you're always talking about kill the flesh. You, 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 don't be carnal. You, know, you, know, you, you got to make, 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 make your, your flesh your slave. But, but the Bible says that, that my flesh is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if my body is so bad, if my body is so evil, why would God want to live here? 
Listen, if you're going to get things in order, you have to realize that this body is not perfect. There may be sickness or breakdowns or ungodly desires or whatever. But I love, I love what David said. He said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I, I think David said that in the morning before he brushed his teeth. Hair just looking all crazy. And he just looks in the mirror. He's like, my God, I am fearfully. And what, God, I have seen your works. They are good. <laughs> you got to learn how to take care of this gift that God's given you. Years ago, I used to struggle with, I mean, debilitating headaches. I, I, I mean, to the point where, and anybody you, you, you've ever suffered from migraines, you know how it is. Like, you, you, no light. Like, I need all the lights off. I'm, I'm, there was days I'd be curled up in my office, all the shades closed, all the lights off. And not to mention, my, my diet was a little bit off. So I was one of those people that if I didn't eat food by 10 or 11 a.m., that headaches would just come. So between not resting properly and not eating properly, I would lose at least three to four days a week just curled up with a migraine because I, I didn't have the food that I needed or didn't have the rest that I needed. And, and it was amazing to me how it did not matter how much I prayed. Didn't matter how much I laid hands on myself, or how much I sought God. If I didn't take care of this physical body that God had given me, my spirit would be rendered useless and my soul had no control. Listen, if we're going to get things back in order, stop ignoring your body and start taking care of it. Getting the sleep. Here, here's the thing that we have to understand. The mindset of the world is never God's mindset. So if the mindset is, if the world is celebrating something, chances are it's counter to what God has for me. And for some reason in the world, we celebrate not sleeping. There's this whole persona about someone who's on their grind. I'm on my grind. I'm, build, I'm hustling. I'm, I'm building something. I don't have time to sleep. Sleep is for the weak. Sleep, sleep is for the poor. No, 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 no. Sleep is for the godly. Because the Bible says that God blesses his children with sleep. Why would he bless me with something? Come on now, don't sleep in this message. But some of y'all need to understand, the most godly thing you can do sometimes is go to sleep. It says that Esau was in this position where his flesh was controlling him. He was starving, hungry, and here's why. Because he went on a hunt that took a little bit longer than he thought it would. Esau was known for being a hunter. He was known for going out and, and killing animals and bringing them back and, and making an amazing meal. And I think on this day, Esau got a little bit arrogant where he thought I was just going to go out, catch me a deer, catch me a buffalo or whatever they hunted back then. And, and it'll only be a few hours. I'll drag it back. I'll be back by lunch. But for some reason this day, what he was hunting was more elusive than he had planned for. And he said, I'll only be hunting for three hours. And three hours turned into six hours. Six hours turned into 12 hours. I don't know if he spent the night out in the woods, but, but by the time he got back, it was longer than he thought it was. I'm having fun. Y'all having fun? Somebody say, preach this. What are you hunting that's taken a little bit longer than you thought it was? And you've been telling yourself, I'll get some sleep when I... I'll get my life back in order when I, I'll slow down when I, I'll, I'll, when, when I finally purchase that first house, when, when I finally get that promotion, when my kids finally get to elementary school, when, when the business finally, what are you hunting that's taking you a little bit longer than you planned? And initially you thought you had it under control, but because of the amount of time that it's taking, you're neglecting your rest. You're neglecting what I call the pace of grace. Here's what blows my mind. Humans are the only ones that are shocked that our bodies are broken. The, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, this precious treasure, the light of God and the power that shines within us, is held in some Tupperware in a perishable container that is in our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within must be from God and is not our own. 
The Bible says we are broken jars of clay holding the greatness of God within. God knows who you are. The Bible says in Hebrews that he can sympathize with your weakness. He knows you get hungry. He knows you get cranky. That's why he doesn't give you revelations after 11 p.m. at night. He's like, go to sleep. I'll talk to you in the morning. I'll still be here. You, you, you need to get you something to eat. You, you need to get you some rest. God is not shocked by our humanity. But yet we are oblivious to the fact, hear me, you have limitations. God, infinite. You, finite. God, all-powerful. You, you need charging daily. <laughs> Some of us, we're like iPhones. We don't charge all the way anymore. <laughs> My battery is diminished. I only get about 60. If you got kids, you only charge to about 60%. <laughs> You're like, all right, that's about all I'm going to get. I have, there's a passage in the Bible dealing with suicide that blew my mind. There's a prophet by the name of Elijah who wanted not to live anymore. Here, here it is in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, says this. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Leave this verse up. Right before this, Elijah had had the greatest miracle ever seen in mankind. He stood on Mount Carmel and literally called fire down from heaven to consume a sacrifice turning an entire nation back to God. And as people were saying, wow, look what God has done, Elijah said, I want to die. Because what we don't realize is the physical exhaustion it takes to release and to push forward all that God has inside of us. And Elijah was completely depleted. It says in verse 5, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, Suddenly an angel, God, God didn't want him to die. So God sent an angel. God was going to heal him. God was going to bless him. God was going to move supernaturally, right? No. The angel came, touched him, and said, arise and eat some beef stew. The name of this message is going to be eat beef stew. That's going to be the, said, arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Watch this. Here is a pastor, a prophet, a man of God on the verge of insanity. God sends a supernatural angel to cook dinner for him and to give him food. Don't miss the spiritual point in that. Now, don't get me wrong. It didn't stop there. He went in, and that's the moment where the storm and the fire and the wind came by, and God spoke to him in a still, small voice. But before Elijah could have a spiritual encounter, he had to take care of his flesh. God says, your problem is your flesh has taken the lead seat in your life, Elijah. You're not thinking straight. Let's take care of your flesh. So many psychologists believe that, yes, that, that suicidal thoughts and depression, it does come from chemical imbalances. Some of it does come from an inability to properly trans, uh, 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 think through tragedy. But they say a lot of, of early onset depression, even suicidal thought, comes from isolation. Comes from a lack of vitamin D that you get from the sun. <laughs> comes from a lack of eating properly and taking, if you would just go outside and take a walk. Get around some people and have a laugh. Eat a good meal. I'm not saying it's that simple and that's going to fix all of your problems. I'm saying that is a good start. If exhaustion and fatigue causes my flesh to take a seat that doesn't belong to it, well, let me make sure that my flesh isn't exhausted and isn't fatigued. First thought, the first step is this. I need to learn how to take care of my flesh. The second thing is this. I need to filter your soul consistently. 
How do I get my life back in the right order? Watch this. You don't just start screaming in tongues for three hours. Don't go on a 40-day fast. Watch this. Deal with the problem. Get your flesh back into a place where it's taken care of and then deal with your spirit. You have to filter your spirit consistently. My spirit is my mind, the thought life, my emotions, my will, and my desire. There's a, there's a funny movie. It's a kid's movie called Inside Out. You ever heard of that movie, Inside Out? It's this cartoon of, of, of this child, and, and it shows you the, the command center of that child's life. And in that command center are these little cartoons and one's sadness, one's anger, I'm not going to lie, that's my favorite one, one's disgust, one's happiness. And, and, and throughout the movie, these different little characters, they fight for control over the command center of that child. So, so, so they, they're not quite getting what they want, so there's disgust and happiness tries to negotiate. And finally, anger says, get out the way, I've got the controls, and it lights everything on fire. That's your soul. That's a biblical movie. That's your soul. And if you're not able to get your soul in order under the right direction, you're going to find yourself at a dangerous place where you're controlled by how you feel instead of the Spirit of God. This obviously was a very long summer for all of us because we spent most of it locked up in our house. And we're like tearing through the house trying to figure out something to do with the kids just to keep them sane. Whose idea was it to work full time with all your children in the house? Hey, this, that had to have been the enemy. We're literally trying to figure out what are we going to do. So we went out and we bought one of those inflatable pools. You ever saw those pools? I mean, this thing was massive and it had the little pump in it. And, and we, we inflated it in the backyard and put water in it. Hey, we're going to the pool today, guys. They grab their shoes. Nope, don't need your shoes. Grab their backpack. Don't need it. Daddy, where are we going? We're going outside. So we go out, we put water in there. I jumped in there with them. We're splashing around. We had the time of our life. It was like gallons and gallons, 10 feet wide. So I figured I'm not going to empty it out right now. We'll just leave it and we can swim tomorrow. Well, we wake up the next day and we look at the pool and there's leaves in the pool. There's some random sediment or dirt or whatever it may be. But they have a man that's leaving. So we jump right back in. I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, <laughs> wish I was lying. Their mom just found out. You need a little dirt to build your immune system, you know? <laughs> we jump right back in there, had the greatest of time. The third day we wake up, we look, there's more leaves. There's more dirt. And we, we didn't jump in the second day. <laughs> They're like, no, please. So let me take that man's kiss. <laughs> but here's what we found. Water that was perfectly clean one day, all we did was leave it. We didn't dump anything in it. We didn't trash it. We didn't misuse it. We just left it. And by leaving it for 12 hours, the, the, the bugs, the, the dirt, the leaves, the fear, the worry, the anxiety, the paranoia, the anger, the, bit, the things of life that just fill through no wrongdoing of Zoe or Roman. It was just natural life. If we could just understand that our soul just picks stuff up. Wow. You, you don't have to live a wretched life. You don't have to go the wrong places. You don't have to have the wrong conversations. You just have to live in this world. And you're going to find something that pours greed inside of you. You're going to find something that puts fear and anxiety and worry inside of you. You're going to find something that gives you a mindset that is not the mindset of Christ. Here's the problem. We've had a lifetime of receiving the, receiving the elements of life. But for many of us, a short season of filtering those things out. And if we're not intentional about saying, okay, what have I picked up? Let me run it. Real pools have a filter. 
<laughs> Real pools, you can leave them out all day long, and it's constantly running that water through a filter that's catching all of the elements and making sure what's pure stays in and what's contaminated gets pulled out. If only we had a filter to run every thought, every ambition, every goal, every cultural perception through, and that we can keep what's pure and trash what's toxic. So I'm around a world that's constantly like, get wealthy, get wealthy, get wealthy. So you can have more, 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 more. And if I don't filter that through God's word, woo, can I preach? I'm going to begin to think that wealth is evil. I'm broken, I'm godly. No, you don't read your Bible. God says he wants you to have more than enough, not that you can get more stuff so that you can be more generous. Poverty is not the antidote to greed. Generosity is. It's not I need more, it's I need to give more because the more that I give, the less stuff has me. I can have stuff, but stuff can never have me and I keep it from having me by being a generous person. All this fear and anxiety that comes, what do I need just to pretend like it's not real? No, I need faith, thank you, and hope, and the wisdom of God. I need, a, the Bible says to be prudent, to be wise. Don't just go jumping off of cliffs. People are like, Pastor, would you ever go skydiving? Yes, if the plane was on fire and it was going down. Other than that, I will never jump out of a perfectly operating plane. The Bible says, test not the Lord. I think it's going to catch me, but I'm not sure, so I'm not jumping. <laughs> we got to filter. What we see here is the Bible says in Romans chapter two, 12, verse 1. And also, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God all. He, for all he has done for you, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice. This is the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. If you have a Bible, underline that. I don't believe in tattoos. Maybe I do. But if you're thinking about one, that ain't a bad one. <laughs> don't copy the behaviors and customs of ungodly people. But let God transform you into a person, new person. Watch this. By changing the way that you think. Ow! Y'all, transformation doesn't come from the laying on of the hand of the man of God. <laughs> transformation doesn't come from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Ghost. But if he's still filtered through a carnal way of thinking you're not going to see the best that God has for you. It says he transformed you by changing the way that you think. Then you learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing. And I'm having a lot more fun than you guys are. You know why a lot of atheists and agnostics and people like that can't accept God? Because they're trying to wrap their mind around God. You don't accept God in your soul. You don't accept God based on an emotion or based on a thought pattern or based on the way that he fits into your ambition. You accept God by faith in your spirit. God, I trust you are who you say you are, and I'm taking that step of faith. Just for fun, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says this, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. But the land is plain. The greatest thing that you can do as a believer is not accept every thought that goes through your head. But when a thought comes in, run it through the word of God. I don't like the way you talk to me. I'm a, f hold on one second. Hey, word, am I offended? Sorry, I'm not allowed to be offended because a righteous man overlooks an offense. This didn't go my way. I am so... Hold on one second. 
hey, word, am I allowed to be sad? I can be, but not when life doesn't go my way, right? Because God has something better for me. I'm so sorry. I'm not sad. I'm just disappointed. Filter every thought through the word of God. Y'all ready to land this plane? Last thing is this. Write this down. Intentionally make the last first. I feel like one of them old school, like, word of faith preachers. Like, remember those guys that used to just hold their Bible the entire message? Turn in your Bible, too. Turn in your Bible. And then it says over here and then over there. Y'all can tell I'm having fun. Oh, so many good stuff. By the way, when Esau said, what is this birthright to me? I'm going to die. Just for fun, y'all, he wasn't going to die. You don't die from not eating for 24 hours. You don't die from not eating for 72 hours. You can actually go 40 days if all you have is water. He was nowhere close to death, but watch this, because he had no control over his emotions. His emotions were painting a reality that was the furthest, furthest from the truth. And here comes Jacob in in this situation, representing the enemy, saying, I'll trade you your future for your now. Yeah, I'll feed your flesh. It's going to cost you your future, but you'll feel good right now. Yeah, I'll give you what, and, and that's what happens when we're led by our flesh or we're led by our soul. We're not thinking about eternity. We're not even thinking 10 years from now. We're just thinking right now in the moment. Here's the thing about Jacob that blows my mind. He didn't have to cheat Esau out of his birthright. God had already given it to him. For some reason, there's this theme in Scripture where God loves the youngest. I can't say loves, but favors the youngest above the oldest. Like it's throughout Scripture. Abraham had two sons. The oldest was Ishmael. The youngest was Isaac. God says Ishmael shall serve Isaac for all of eternity. You come to the next sons, then you have Jacob and Esau, and God says, Jacob is blessed. He is the one that's going to rule over his older brother Esau. God had already favored Jacob. Esau being the oldest, he was already going to serve his brother. You fast forward to the next generation. You guys remember Joseph, the guy that got the Gucci coat from his dad? He was the youngest, and all of his brothers hated him because it was, somebody say, out of order. The youngest should not be older over the oldest. The oldest should be over the youngest. You guys remember David? David was the youngest of his family, but God says, no, he is going to be the king. I've despised his older brothers, but there is some theme in Scripture that the youngest is favored over the oldest. Matter of fact, God brings that same theme between Adam and Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says this, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. But the last Adam, that's a term for Jesus. Jesus is considered the last Adam. Why? Adam is the origin of life. Adam was the origin of natural life. Jesus was the origin of eternal life. It says the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You ever heard the phrase, the first shall be last and the last shall be? This theme throughout Scripture that the youngest shall rule over the oldest. Somebody say, I'm three parts. I'm body, I'm soul, and I'm spirit. Which part of you is oldest? Pregnant pause. Like... You're not all the same age. Your flesh, your soul, and your spirit weren't all born on the same day. Your flesh was born on your birthday. Your soul a little bit after that as you were picking up on cues. If you have a newborn, you know there's a certain age before they give the first smile. He smiled at me. Nope, that was a twitch. They're not interested in you at all. There's a day that the soul catches up, but your spirit wasn't born until you were born again. Your spirit came alive during the time that you surrendered your life to Christ. So in the hierarchy of your life, your flesh is the oldest 
and your spirit is the... Throughout Scripture, God is trying to show us a picture that the youngest should rule over the oldest. Your spirit should be in control and your flesh should serve it. Any youngest children in here? Any youngest? Any youngest? Any spoiled brats? (laughs) Every oldest child thinks the youngest is spoiled. Hear me. But every youngest child thinks that they're neglected. It's all about perspective. If you grew up in a family like I did where you got whoopings, you say things like this. By the time the youngest came, our parents were too tired to whoop them. The youngest has the mindset of, by the time I came along, they didn't care to raise me. That's why I didn't get whooped. Perspective. Y'all didn't know I was going to go deep there. If you're not careful, the youngest part of you, the quietest part of you, that's supposed to rule all of you, is going to be the part that gets neglected. You don't forget to eat. Hmm? See the commercial? You're not yourself when you're hungry. Grab a Snickers. You may be too busy to eat breakfast and you just run out, but oh, you're going to eat lunch. Come on now. Some of you had 21 days of prayer fasting, or 21 days of prayer. <laughs> Couldn't make it through lunch. Oh, I know. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Is this graham cracker going to mess up my miracle? Because I'm going to mess somebody's face up if I don't eat something right now. Come on now. You don't forget to eat. And you don't really neglect your soul. You know when you're not happy. You know when you're sad. You know when you need a vacation. You you know. That's one of the reasons why this whole pandemic thing has been so miserable. Because we haven't been able to vacation and replenish our soul. How many of us go weeks not even thinking about our spirit? Spirit, are you hungry? Are you neglected? Do you need attention? Because you're the one that I need leading my life. I'm going to maximize all that God has for me. Somebody say, Pastor, make it practical. Great. Feed your spirit every day. If you feed your flesh, feed your spirit. This is not a legalist church. If it were, though, I'd say feed your spirit before you feed your flesh. What does that mean? Before you eat breakfast. I'm not that legalistic. You eat breakfast while you pray. (laughs) Psalm 5.3 says this, my voice you shall hear when? During my lunch break. My voice you shall hear when? At the end of the day, when I'm exhausted and tired and trying to read my Bible right before I fall asleep. No, in the morning. Oh, Lord, in the morning, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. What you focus on will lead you. And if you let the wrong thing lead you, it doesn't matter how much effort you put in. You're never going to see the results you want. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful. God, that you've given us your word. God, to give us wisdom for divine order in our life. God, I feel like I can repent on behalf of all of us because all of us at some point have been flesh driven or emotions driven or ambition driven. God, we want to be spirit led. God, we're praying even right now that you would help us see the areas in our life that we've gotten out of order, that we can bring back an alignment to you. Right where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, let's do some spirit work in this moment. Can you just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just give God a moment to make this message personal to you. In our relationships in our jobs, in our finances. Who's leading? Is it our flesh? Is it our thought life, our ability to rationalize things? Or are we led by the Spirit of God in us? 
I said earlier that your spirit is the last part of you, the youngest part of you to come alive because God's word says inside your spirit, man, is dead in sin. The only way that it can come alive is when you accept Jesus into your life. That's what salvation is. It's not getting things together. It's not being good. It's being alive on the inside. Maybe you're watching online or maybe you're in this room and you can say, Pastor, I've been to church, I know the Bible, but I can't say that God's ever made me alive on the inside. I can't say that my spirit is alive, but, but I want Jesus to, to make me new. If that's you, it'd be my greatest honor, my greatest privilege to introduce you to the greatest miracle that has ever taken place in life. And that's the miracle of being born again. That's you right where you are. Can you pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for making it possible to have a relationship for you to live inside of me. Thank you for dying on the cross so that none of my sin, none of my mistakes can separate me from you. Today, I invite you in my life. Make me alive. I declare that you're my Lord, you're my Savior. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, church, can you celebrate for every single person that just made the greatest decision ever?